welcome me back to another episode of Think Tech for Wise Human Humane Architecture, broadcasting live here from the, my, the capital city of my native country, Germany, in Berlin. And I'm having with me for the volume three of the Pioneer and Resort Architecture, Soto Brown, back in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hi, Soto. How do you do, everybody? Great. And we have our friend Ron Lindgren, a uh, friend and partner and uh, all of that and more of the legendary at Kingsworth uh, with us from in Long Beach, California. Hi, Ron. Aloha. Can we have uh, slides one up and we're going to dive right in where we, uh, where we left it last time. And uh, this is uh, showing... Um, you at the Kahala uh, Hilton at an event which brought you back to the island uh, some few months ago, uh, where you guys both were keynote speakers and an, at an event that you got to remind us to sort of what which that one was. Well, Docomomo is an organization, international organization, which uh, hopes to preserve and celebrate mid-century architecture. And last year, the International Docomomo Conference occurred here in Honolulu. And as you said, Ron got to speak at that. I got to speak at that. There were tours of various locations. And in all, it was uh, kind of an orgy of excitement, you might say, for people who like this particular type of architecture. Absolutely. And we can go to the second slide here. And um, this is just reminding us of the spectacular, the provocative location of that specific hotel. And in this mapping here, uh, the hotel uh, management, I guess, was, was trying to make us buy into how conveniently located it, it was or, or still is. And we're thinking about when you see the, the few minutes that it's supposedly away or close to other locations, it makes them wonder what the mode of transportation might be. It somehow made us think it might be a helicopter. And we were getting to that. And actually, there were some guests that probably most likely came with a helicopter that you just sort of told us about. But um, while the last two shows were actually about Euron reporting sort of on behalf of, uh, of F. Killingsworth, who was um, the, the principal of the firm, and, and um, at that time you hadn't even joined the firm when, when the hotel was, was built, and uh, you just sort of were uh, at the beautiful early teenager age, and I even hadn't seen the light of the earth yet. <laughs> so um, to, today we actually want to talk about when you guys were more consciously eyewitnessing the hotel uh, years later, and I guess us to the next slide, which is a compilation um, of um, uh, previous shows we have we have done, and uh, it basically shows um, you know different modes of transportation among some of them are PI and mobile that you just so kindly keep right now, and that is. You know, of the age of, um, you know, was, was, was first introduced in the early 70s and then made it to the late 80s. And that was spanning quite a time of when you guys were doing one of the most beautiful hotels on the island. And you all have done the, um, the Holy Kalani, um, in the, in the 80s and then moved on to coming back and basically touch up the Kaala Hilton, and I was, when you see at the top right, you see our friend Andrea Bresky, who uh, some of the pictures we have uh, labeled accordingly, uh, we're using the show, have been done by him. That mode of transportation, this beautiful Italian bicycle in the past, that reminded you, uh, Ron, about these days when you were back on the island, right? And please tell us about it. Yeah, I uh, uh, will be talking about when the Kahala suddenly became something else other than the Kahala, when another management company took over. When that happened, I came out for a year to be the architect's uh, representative on site. Uh, and I must have been in better shape than I am now because I would actually get up early in the morning, jump on my bike from the Waikiki Park Hotel, which is right next to the Hale Kalani, and I had designed the preliminary design for the park 
as well as Haleklani. And then I would bike up to the lighthouse, and the sun would suddenly pop up over the horizon. <laughs> and then I'd coast all the way down to Kahala. And uh, it was a wonderful year. Uh, but there's, you see in the very up, upper picture, there's a black and white of someone by themselves. Uh, Ed's partner, Wa Smith, was the architect's representative for when the Kahala was originally built. And it turned out to be so complicated and too much for him that he asked to be replaced. Then he quit architecture as a profession completely for the rest of his life. Oh, my. Oh, wow. <laughs> and again, don't worry about it. You know, you're, you're about the age that I am in right now. So not only were you in great shape way back, you're still in greater shape than this photo and I because you still have that stuff on your head. That's Definitely right. Some one. of us. So don't worry about it. <laughs> That's exactly right. Some some people are blessed and others are cursed. There you go. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and so here's our PI mobile facility taking good care of it. And we're approaching our Kahala actually from his backside, and then we all basically convened in the lobby, and you were talking stories. And, and you actually had four tours that day, Ron, but this was a, was, a, was another special tour he did for us. Some of us who weren't able to participate in any of the, uh, in any of the previous tours. And let's go to the next slide, um, where you see um, yourself at the top left in the lobby taking a picture. And I want to refer to a very special video that YouTube out there that Harvey Keller did with Ed when he was getting up in age and did a wonderful interview with him. And one of the first projects that Ed was probably sharing was the Kahala Hilton, but not only in its original condition, but at that time very close to your uh, project, Ron, and touching it up. And he was uh, not only sharing the budget that we want to hear you um, remembering that, but also about details, for example, that the beautiful chandelier that you had told us about and designed it in the last show, the, uh, the Kahala management wanted to get rid of that, and you were successfully fighting for keeping that. So tell us a little bit about the budget and the, the, the corporation that took over the ownership and the management, Ron. Yes, in 1994, Ed Killingsworth and all of his employees were shocked to hear that the Kahala had dropped the Hilton Hotel in Honolulu from their roster of hotels, and it was going to be taken over and managed by the Mandarin Oriental uh, Group. And when Ed heard that, he felt quite a bit better about that, because as it turns out, Mandarin Oriental Hotels have existed since 1876 when they opened their first hotel in Hong Kong, which is still their headquarters. And they, at the moment, operate 41 hotels, 10,000 rooms in about 27 different countries, including in Munich, as I told you, uh, Martin, where they're located in the old town part of uh, Munich in what used to be the old Hotel Raphael Munich. So, yeah, and um, the gentleman who, who's associated with that and owns the beautiful house on Kahala Avenue on the way to the hotel that you shared with me, right? Yes, indeed. Uh, the, the Mandarin people, as soon as we met them, we all felt more comfortable because they were, they were really thrilled to add the Kahala to their roster of hotels. And so they closed it for an entire year from 1994 to 1995. And we had a year to spend a $55 million budget to do an awful lot of work on the hotel because when Mandarin took it over, it was 30 years old. Uh, almost all of that $55 million went into things that you cannot see but had to be done. And by that, I mean electrical, mechanical, plumbing systems. Some of them had to be torn out completely, repairs everywhere. There had to be upgrades to the structure even for tsunami resistance. Uh, and all of the hotel interiors had to be refreshed. Uh, we had to take care of things like Americans with disability requirements, which weren't in the hotel. And strangely enough, we also had to do something for our dolphins in the lagoon. There was suddenly a requirement to build a new little section off the lagoon, a little deeper, 18 feet, 
which suddenly had become required as a place to take the dolphins when they're ill so they can be treated. So we had to do a lot of things, uh, which really can't be seen. And there was, there was limited new construction. At grade, there was an exercise facility. There was a new pool snack bar. There was a child care facility. Uh, but the biggest construction was a new restaurant called Hoku's. And we'll talk about that more when we've got a picture of the interior very soon. Yeah, let's do this now. Let's move on to the next slide and share that with us, Ron. Yeah, what I'd, what I'd like to say here is not only did I have the, the very great honor of talking on a Friday as one of the 12 speakers, featured speakers, but on Saturday I had maybe the most fun I've had uh, as an older person. Uh, I actually gave four tours. I had two busloads of Docomomo people, 25 people each, who had come from a Jean Charlot house and from a Vladimir Osipov house to come to the Kahalit for me to give them a guided tour. So there were two of those. Then uh, I had met all sorts of new acquaintances, and this, uh, Martin, who I certainly call you a friend now, uh, we arranged to meet together as a fourth tour after all that was over. But while I was waiting, I was sitting in the lobby, which is shown in the picture, and a young couple was sitting there with Doko Momo pins on. And I asked them, "Had you, uh, did, were you unable to get tickets for the tour? And they said, yes. Well, I'm going to give you the tour. So I gave <laughs> this, this, this young couple the tour as the third tour, and the fourth tour were all of the people that you see in this photograph. And you can yeah, also, let me just... Out, I, yeah, I was just yeah. also going to say, too, that if you look in the in the left distance, beyond the lobby, you see the Hoku's restaurant. And in the picture just above that, you can see a picture of the Halikulani Hotel, which was designed by Ron as well. So Ron was able to mimic something that he had done at uh, the Halikulani to build this new structure at the um, revamped and remodeled Kahala, formerly Hilton. Yeah, but you, you just saw to uh, share with us what used to be on that situation that Ron then sort of rearranged that you remember from your childhood. Well, this is this was very interesting. When I met you, Ron, you pointed out that the site of the what's now the Hoku's restaurant, which is the upscale restaurant in the hotel, had originally been, as you said, the most expensive and underused shuffleboard court in the world. And... I can remember, even at the age of 10, visiting the hotel when it was open for the first time and looking at this shuffleboard court, which was originally there off to the Makai side of the lobby, thinking, this is really unappealing. It's kind of like wasted space. I had no architectural knowledge at the time, but it struck me even as a kid that this was a weird underutilization of the space. And I think we can go to the next slide and see what got done with that space, because now when you look through, you see the Hoku's restaurant in the place that it ought to be, utilizing what was this under underappreciated concrete expanse on which I actually did play shuffleboard as a kid, which is now this elegant restaurant. Next slide. Let's go inside. Next slide. Oh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. There we are inside. Yeah, what, I'd, what I'd like to say is that uh, in reality, uh, even though, indeed, that uh, that roof over a restaurant at grade was nothing other than a shuffleboard court, Ed Killingsworth had always intended that a restaurant be built there someday. Uh, and his plan had a single-pitched Hawaiian tile roof. But uh, coming from my experience learning about C.W. Dickey and putting double-pitched uh, roofs on the Kapalua Bay Hotel and the Haleklani Hotel. I did the same thing on this restaurant, Hoku's. This picture is showing that uh, we used the volume in the roof uh, so that uh, the space really is quite elegant. It actually helps somewhat with uh, toning down the noise that sometimes can be a problem in a restaurant as well. And so that was Hoku's. Uh, it is a hermetically sealed restaurant only because Mandarin wanted the kitchen that's attached to it to be completely open to the guests. And when you do that, you can't have operable windows, or at least you can't have open windows, because obviously birds and, and uh, vermin and flies and whatever would fly in. 
but they still have uh, a chance to open them uh, on occasion when they when they wash the windows. And maybe in the reopening, which is supposed to happen on June 1st, uh, they could crack them a bit to have some fresh air to ventilate in this age of COVID-19, where guests hopefully will all be seated far enough apart that the social distancing is there. And with a little ventilation, that will also help the situation to make the the guests returning to the hotel safer. Yeah. And, and that being said, Ron, I have to say, referring to the top right little uh, quotation of a show we did, uh, where we're you know, um, sharing with the audience when your uh, former colleague has shown you the remodeling of your FTT Park Hotel for the Halakuna, and the New York architect uh, basically had done it nicely, but as you pointedly said, you know, not very tropically. So, again, you, you were ahead of the game in almost foreseeing the changes that would come, and that, you know, the administration... Is, is, is actually of, of your of your restaurant in the in the Kahala Hotel is more timely than the just finished renovation of the lobby of the Hale Puna. I can't help Indeed. Say. Let's go to the next slide here, uh, which is us um, basically you know going away from the uh, restaurant towards the uh, main lobby and the circulation in, in the distance, which gets you up into the into the uh, into the hotel. And here you are, Ron, with your esteemed and interested audience, um, you know, um, enjoying your your great tour. And, and there, there's and one. Yes. I was going to say there's the stairway on the left, which goes down to the lower level, which we've talked about in our previous shows. And then on the right, as Ron pointed out to us earlier, the crowd on the right is where they're checking in at the check-in desk because this is the main lobby, and we'll just walk through here to go straight to where the elevators are in our next picture. Mm-hmm. And one mm-hmm. comment about that is that Ed was so smart to have the entry lobby be just that, an entry welcoming lounge space. And sometimes the check-in and check out procedure can get a little noisy, especially if there's a conflict over the bill. So it was held uh, as shown in this picture to the right of that photo, but far enough away from the lobby so that any of that sort of noise wouldn't be leaking into that quiet, serene and classic space. Right. Yeah. And Ron, you were also pointing out quite sort of astonishingly you use a very soft material being wood in a highly frequented, you know, area of the lobby and how much warmth and, and hominess that basically adds to the atmosphere of, of the lobby, Ryan. What this photo shows for the first time, we, we've, we've shown the lobby, for example, in black and white photos before from as far ago as when it first opened in 64. But this is the existing 1964 parquet floor which all we had to do was just kind of uh, smooth it out a bit, re-wax it, and it made this wonderful warm. There was no need for carpets because the floor itself was a wonderful carpet from wall to wall. Yeah. Wonderful, yeah. So let's go up into the building, go to the next slide, which uh, on the right side of the image shows uh, uh, the elevator, and then there's this little display which has a hula doll, uh, from supposedly 1930s, and it struck me that this is the only thing that's almost the predominant way in all the hotels these days when they want to brand themselves with the pre-contact. Well, here the modern, the, 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 the hotel is truly presenting itself as a modern uh, resort that doesn't need to rely on excuse me, to say kitsch from the past, from the yeah. Polynesian pop, which we have a lot of respect for, I don't get this wrong, but, but again, here the hotel doesn't need to dwell on that. And and the, the second part on the left basically shows that really clever trick that having uh, the, um, the, when you get off the elevator, you step into something rather surprising, which is daylight, so it has access to the, to the exterior of the facade, and it pours light into... Um, where you see um, John Williams here standing and, and how beautiful uh, that makes uh, the, the double-loaded corridor, not this dark truck, but a very pleasant, and the light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak, is almost like a natural wayfinding device. Yeah. Quite beautiful, 
Yes. And go to the next slide, is more stunningly is basically the view, right, that you get when you get out of the elevator. All of a sudden, you have this panoramic view over the, the Mount Rages, Mauka, and the golf course, which is really stunning. Yeah. I must say and that... And it's also the North was, Facade, right? Yes. I must say that Ed was so clever in laying out the hotel because originally there were two guest room wings, and he pushed them uh, uh, far apart from each other at the centralized lobby so that no matter where you were in a corridor, no matter which way you looked, you saw daylight at the end of the corridor, which helps with that problem of feeling sort of trapped in the the awful uh, corridor situation that some hotels have. And here uh, I was showing some of the Docomomo members how even though the people who had rooms on facing to uh, the north didn't have a direct ocean view, it was still a pretty spectacular view over the Wailai Golf Course to the Ko'olau Mountains. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and this is uh, Ann Motonaga, by the way, who was a proud resident also of the Kahal apartment next door, a recent resident who inspired by having met you and uh, has decided to move in there as long as she can until the lease comes out and we don't know what, what's going to happen. And you got to get back to Anne, by the way, because she wants to stay in touch and do some more oral and, and other history with you, Ron. So I need to remind you of that, too. I like, I'm looking forward to that. Great. So let's get to, into a representative room. Let's go to the next slide here. And uh, let's talk about that a little bit. And also the lady on your left, Ron, introduce her to us. Yeah, we're, we're looking at uh, one of the rooms that, for example, did not have a lanai. Basically, every other of the typical rooms had a lanai, and then the other, one, other ones between them just had this sort of step-out Romeo and Juliet balcony. And uh, we're looking out to the ocean view. And I just wanted to uh, put a shout-out for the young Japanese woman I was talking to on the left. And she happens to be a Kahala employee, and she is the Asian public relations and marketing sales manager. But she was so kind to arrange the fact that all three tours, except for the young couple that I spoke to by myself, all got to see a typical guest room, which is revolutionary, and then see what happens when a number of typical guest rooms are connected together and become suites. I really thank her uh, so much, Wakako Sasaki. Awesome. And let's take a look at how the room looks when you look the other direction for the next slide for that. I had, hadn't seen the, uh, the remodelings that have happened since, uh, really since, uh, 1964. Uh, this, in my mind, is a little bit heavy-handed with the Hawaiiana, but the fact that there's that wonderful paddle fan is a really nice touch. That's always a nice touch. And the hotel is getting close to that time when it's going to need another refreshment of the rooms, all rooms and suites. And it'll be interesting to see what the designers and maybe the architects that get involved might have in mind. This happens to be and along a these lines, the solo. So I can't wait for that reason, being able to get back to the Bishop Museum and digging out some of the uh, original photographs of how the hotel was. And now it's, it's, it's a vintage gem, so it actually might be worth to reconsider going full circle and to the very original in the next remodeling. Oh, yeah, so that's absolutely right. Yes, absolutely right. And and there are a few pictures in Bishop Museum that show the original rooms from when the hotel opened in 1964. And I agree with you, Ron, that this is a little bit um, heavy-duty, what we're looking at in this picture right here in terms of the what the room looks like. But um, one of the things that I think we can mention, if we go to our final picture, last picture in our presentation today, up in the upper right corner you see Martin's dear friend Suzanne, and he's as if looking up at her and taking a picture of her. And she was a guest at the Kahala Hilton back in the 1990s or about early 2000. Yeah. Um, yeah. And she's the person who has reminded us frequently that hotels must always keep reinventing themselves. They must always keep updating, freshening, 
cleaning up and making themselves look modern and appealing. And so that's exactly what we just have talked about when the last time the hotel went through a big change like that. Well, it's almost time, as Ron just said, for it to do it again. So we'll see what comes of that. And the basic structure that we see on this exterior view from the lanai of this exterior lattice work that we talked about in our previous shows is still going to be there. But what goes on inside will always make a difference in the guest experience to make people want to come back because it's not old-fashioned. And my, my greatest wish is that when those rooms are refreshed, that it's done by a local Hawaiian firm of interior designers, architects. Uh, the fact that Hale Puna in Waikiki was basically completely redesigned by designers from New York City meant that they, in fact, didn't get hardly any of the Hawaiiana in the rooms. They looked like a room, a nice room, in New York City. And I'm hoping that uh, this next group who get together might even talk to me about that, in my opinions. Yeah. Well, let's do that. I can't wait for that. Until then, let's uh, wish the gentleman next to you, Ron, uh, Richard Lowe, our multiple you know, gifts and, and shows of the past. Um, wish him all the best, because as we're talking, he, there's some, he has to have some work done on, on him and, and uh, he's going to be in the hospital. So, uh, Rich, all the best for that. We look forward to having you back soon and, and join us uh, in the club of um, thinking about session. And uh, stay all safe and sound and see you next week. Okay. Bye. Bye. Bye.